delight to have you here this morning as we worship together in joy and thanksgiving for all that God has given us throughout this week, looking forward with hope to what God has in store for us. Today, everything that you need for worship will be found in your bulletin or in the United Methodist hymnals. And we welcome you, those that worship online with us, either Facebook or YouTube, to this experience and to feel the presence of God in your midst. We want you always and everywhere to know, whether you're online or here in person, that you have a congregation that cares about you and loves you. So, as we join into worship, let us be mindful of the announcements that we have uh, before us. And so I will just open up to say, do we have any announcements that we need to share? As you're thinking about that, I just want to tell you that we've had a busy week throughout this week. And I want to celebrate with you the work of our teams and the work of our outreach team as they went to Seafoam and they packed cookies and put together pizza and as they put together bags for, for people to come through, over 125 bags of food were delivered for somebody and for families to have meals that night. And I can tell you we had such a delightful time working together shoulder to shoulder and serving those foods. So we can celebrate the work of our community there. I will also say that this last Saturday, yesterday, we got together with churches from uh, all over our circuit. We've got together with churches like Emmanuel United Methodist Church. We got together at Walnut Hills, New Hope. We got together with Bloomfield and Maple Grove. We got together with churches in our circuit to talk about what does it mean to work together. And I want to celebrate with you our leadership. Because I've been in a lot of these meetings, but our leadership ran that move meeting so smoothly and so wonderfully. And it had some outcomes that we are excited to see where we can work together in the future. We've got some meetings throughout this week. Take a look at the calendar and take a look in your bulletin at the back. And lastly, I will tell you that we are, we're going to be starting a Bible study on Wednesdays at noon. We're trying that time out to see how it works with people's schedule. If you think that you would like to come to this Bible study or like to look into a Bible study, maybe it's been a while since you've been in a Bible study, sign up for it. We'll get together. I don't know the start date yet. It's going to be towards the end of September, early October. Uh, so probably not the end of September, because that would be this next week, right? So early October. And we're just going to walk with each other as we find out what this new experience looks like for us. There is a sign-up sheet in the back on the board. You can sign up by the, uh, there's a website. You can email me, or you can call the front office, and they will, we will make sure you sign up. And then I will send out an email as soon as I can kind of saying this is going to be the first time we gather. If there's no other uh, announcements, let us stand and join together in the call to worship. <laughs> God of promise, Abraham scoffed and Sarah laughed when you, told, when you told them of your plans for the future and their family. Yet, Lord God, you remain faithful to your promises. Abraham and Sarah welcomed the strangers with joy, so we too are welcomed, turning stranger into family. God greets us with joy, saying, rest here for a while. Be renewed and revived in your spirit. Let us rest in this holy place as family, in joy, and be renewed for God's promises of love and mercy will never fail. Join with us in How Great Thou Art, number 77, in your United Methodist Hymn.
and love by lifting up the prayers of joys that we have, those celebrations that we felt throughout this week, and concerns or frustrations that we've been carrying with us, maybe worries that we need to lift up and place on the altar of God. I will tell you I'm a little hard of hearing, so as you shout a joy and concern, please use your name first. Uh, I, I'm getting to know most of the names, but I'm still a little new, so it helps me out. And then also, maybe if you could say it loud enough that I hear, okay? So, as we think about what it means to lift one another up in prayer, because we believe in the power of prayer, what are the joys, what are the concerns that you carry with you? I have a great concern. I had my 12th great-grandchild this month. Very good. You had, what's that? And I'm Betty Colby. Betty, yes. And Betty, uh, you said it was a concern that you had your 12th great-grandchild. <laughs> it's a joy, though, right? Sometimes we don't know, so that's a very good thing. Yes, so we can lift up Betty with the joy of having another great-grandchild. The 12th. All right, what other things can we lift up today? Yes. Hi, I'm Judy. Um, I think our teens that uh, were divided into task force yesterday would really appreciate prayer as they seek God's leadership in, in the new ventures that we're taking. Very good. So Judy is lifting up the, the opportunity to get together with our circuit last week, but the leadership from each church and our own church is going to be prayer as we move forward. What does it mean to go forward with God and live into God's future? And so thank you for lifting that up, Judy. What other things? Blanche. I'm Blanche, and I had the joy of serving with Steve on this week. And it was really inspirational. The people were so kind and I'm very grateful. Amen. And so one of the things that many others don't, Blanche was talking about the joy of serving with Seafoam this last week as we got together and being with others and learning from them as they might be in need, but we're in need of understanding of what it means to be servants as well. And so the other thing I will say is Blanche kept on sn uh, sneaking cookies to my daughter as they were putting them into the bag. <laughs> so maybe prayers for the, the asks for cookies that I get, but no, thank you for doing that, Blanche. It was a great time. Share it. My brother, that's one of my brothers at home, my old he is in remission. Okay. So we will be uh, both in joy, Sharon, for your brother, who's in remission for multiple myeloma, mm -hmm. and, um, and then we'll also be in prayer for the continued recovery for that. So thank you, Sharon. What other things can we lift up today? Yes. Sue, Carmen, I just found out I'm going to be a grandma again. This is my second. <laughs> All right. So Sue's saying that she's going to be a grandma again, which is just such a blessing in our midst, and so 10 more there, yeah. and then we're, we're catching up with Betty here, and so this is good. What other things can we lift up? I have a joy that my granddaughter in California got moved into her dorm and started at Stanford, and she loves her classes, and she's going to try out for orchestra and science things and do much stuff, but she's having fun. <laughs> So you, a, a joy for a granddaughter that got moved into Stanford and this new journey of what that means. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did I see a hand? Yes, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. And uh, last evening after the uh, meeting here at the church, I was, uh, had a family time and we built a, a fire and had s'mores. Oh my. So and it was a beautiful. Is this the first fire of the season? Yes, it is. All right, great. So Mary Allen is lifting up great family time of having a fire together, making s'mores together, and maybe that transition into fall, where we have this joyous time of what it means to go into the harvest and go into the waiting where God is coming in our midst. All right. Well, let's take a time. Mike is going to lead us in a prayer this morning. If we could be in an attitude of prayer. Lord, steadfast love and mercy, through your word we have set promises before your people. <clears throat> promises for good and not evil. Promises for care and not for harm. Promises fulfilled through life and death. 
promises realized through sorrow and joy. You may have seen us in our good moments and in our hard times, but you have always kept your promise to show us love and compassion. Eternal is your word and love, life altering your love. Remind us once again in worship of that love which knows no bounds. Guide us in your desire for justice and forgiveness and teach us to give even you even as you are giving. Let us hear once again of your forgiveness and your hope guided, uh, guided us in righteousness. We think of those in our community who need a message of hope we declare in our hearts and out loud. For the community we care so much about, we pray now for those with an unfavorable diagnosis or a chron chronic illness bring healing. We pray for those feeling stuck, stuck in unwanted relationships, stuck in unwanted jobs, stuck in hardened cir life circumstances. Bring peace and clarity. We pray for those with major life changes, some life changes which are joyous. Let us remember these always. Some life changes forced upon us. Let us remember if you are the great shepherd which guides us toward freedom. We pray for those who feel crushed, oppressed, like the system is stacked against them. Bring your justice. We pray for those, we pray that we might know more of your, of you, God, more of, the, more of your joy, more of your happiness, more of your freedom. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to beckon about your name, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the light is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is wonderful. We are going to welcome the children up for a moment of children's time. So today, we're going to hear a scripture here in just a few minutes about uh, Abraham and Sarah. And there's something that happens in this scripture that is kind of fun, and just a minute is about, and it makes us think about what it, what it means to laugh, all right, what it means to laugh. So I want you to think about for a second, what makes you laugh? What makes you laugh? Yes, it's Also, is it like I don't know. That's a good question. We'll search it out. We'll search it out afterwards, okay? When mom tickles you, it makes you laugh? Yes. Um, when people say funny jokes and when my mother tickles. <laughs> when you get me to move when I'm lazy. Yeah, so when you hear a funny joke? Anybody else have something they want to share about what makes them laugh? No? Okay, so one of the things that makes me laugh is dad jokes. Have, have, have you ever heard a dad joke before? Yes. So many times, my dad says them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I have a few dad jokes for you. Yes, Isabel. Yes, you always say that. <laughs> the great thing about dad jokes is that they're so funny to everyone. Do you, you know, really think your children like dad jokes? No, <laughs> they should be really dad. <laughs> 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 what we 
find funny sometimes is those jokes. So I got a few of them for you. I, I just want you to see if you can. What do you get when you combine a fish and an elephant? A fish. As fish and elephant. Yes, this about. A pelican? No, it's not a pelican. But you might get swimming trunks. What is that supposed to mean? Okay, how about this one? How about this? What do you call a cow in an earthquake? <laughs> you love trying to guess things. What is it? Is it about? No? Kind of. Eli? A milkshake! That's right. A cow in an earthquake is a milkshake. All right, so, did you hear the one about the broken pencil? Isabel? No, because, well, actually I have. No? Actually, well, it did really have a point. Ah! <laughs> oh. oh, the point! <laughs> Why can't you hear a pterodactyl in the bathroom, Carmen? Because it's, um, like, Mike, you might know this one. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl in the bathroom? Because they're all dead. Because the P is silent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to say <laughs> Okay, how about this? Why did a golfer bring two pairs of pants to the range? Carmen, what do you think? Um, because he needed a change of pants in case he lost the hole. Well, kind of. He thought he would get a hole in one. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about a laughter, and maybe not that aha laugh that we get from a dad joke, but maybe, maybe laughter that comes from our belly. The scripture today says that Sarah, when hearing, the, when hearing what was going to happen, had a laughter that came from her belly. Now, the question is, does God still make us laugh. Both will, uh, so what do we need to feel like, uh, like we're laughing? Life can be hard sometimes. This is me talking now, okay? <laughs> Life can be hard sometimes. It can be one of those things that we don't know the next direction to go. We don't know what the next thing is going to be. There can be great things in it. There can be some things that are not so great in our midst. And what do we do then? And we're going to hear about how Abraham entertains, once again, welcomes, once again, the promises of God. And I can tell you this, in my life, one of the greatest things has been this deep centeredness that I get from knowing that God is with me and know that knowing that things can be good. How we greet life determines what we're going to get out of life. And when we go with God and hear the centeredness that you can have, that there's promises and hopes and good things that can happen, can we do that as we go forward together? Do you think that's something we can do? And we might find out that when we do that, things don't go the way we want, and life seems like it's upside down, inside out, and we might find when things aren't exactly how we wanted them to be, they might be something a little bit different, but even a little bit different. A little bit better. And maybe it will create us a laugh with God once again. Yes, Carmen? I think when a girl kind of laughed in her stomach, I think she was hungry. She was hungry when she was laughing in her stomach? Yeah, because her stomach can't laugh. It's impossible. Yeah. It has to be a stomach growl. Yeah, so when we say that she laughed with her belly, it means that it was a deep laugh that came from within her very soul. You know? It was something more than just a ha-ha that comes from a dad. Uh -huh. All right? So maybe you can do this with me. When you feel stuck, maybe you can just wait with God and wait on the promises and where God is going to take you and start to look for the good in your midst. Can you pray with me? God, we ask that you continue to make us laugh. Continue to allow us to see where you are acting and moving in our world. And allow us to know that as we greet the world with a centered heart, with a joyful spirit, with hope, that we can see things in a different perspective. We ask this in your holy name.
right. Thank you guys for coming up. Let's listen to the scripture together. Okay? Thank you, Mike. 
What a wonderful thing to come together in today to think about where God is leading us as a congregation and as people of God. And today, I want you to think about how God will make you laugh. God will make you laugh. Uh, as we go into this narrative lectionary, this is the second Sunday of the narrative lectionary. If you want to have a seat, you can. That's great. And, and the second Sunday of the narrative lectionary, we're going on this journey to think about where the promises and covenants of God enter into our story, both the story of the Hebrew Bible and the story of our lives as people who follow Christ. We're thinking about what those promises mean to God's character and what it means to have a relationship with God and with people who are in that journey together. What it means to have a relationship with people in the world around us. And so this is the narrative lectionary we'll be using throughout the fall. We'll be going through the Hebrew Bible scriptures, and then sometime in the Advent season, we'll switch over to the Gospel lessons, and uh, we'll go through the Gospel of Mark to hear how the story continues through the Hebrew scriptures and into what we call the New Testament. There will be a few Sundays where we have a guest speaker uh, to come and talk to us. We'll just step out of the narrative lectionary and we'll do something different, but that's the general gist of it, okay? So, the question I have for you as we join together today is, what do you do when life has not gone the way that you thought it should? What do you do when life does not go the way that you thought life should go? <laughs> You know, throughout this summer, we've been talking about dreams. We've talked about dreams a lot. We've stopped, talked about what dreams could be, maybe what dreams would be, maybe what dreams should be. Well, what do we do when those dreams turn into something else? What, if we, what do we do when those dreams seem to be dormant or laid aside or silent in our midst? Unsized dreams, unrealized dreams, impatient dreams. What do we do? Now, sometimes those dreams, unsized, right? They lay dormant because we had a, an expectation of what could be done or what should be done or what would be done. And that wasn't the same expectation of God. And we need to sit with God and be centered in that moment. It's easy to think. Maybe it all went wrong. Maybe God got it wrong. Maybe we didn't get it right. It's easy to think that when things and dreams and things aren't going the way they think they should, that maybe there's something we did or something the church did or something God did. It's easy to think that maybe they're not right. What do we do? When dreams do not turn out to be anything we thought they were. Have you felt that? You know, we got to catch up a little bit from where we were last week if we're talking about the narrative lectionary. Last week as we talked, we talked about the second creation story. We ended with the all of humanity and all of creation being created, and we ended with this deep sense of relationship with God. A God that is in, intimate enough that God will get down into the muck and mire, form the dust and the water together, make this clay structure, and breathe life into it. And it beckons us to think about everybody that has been created as a blessed child of God. And to greet them with that love and respect because they are a blessed child of God. Today we're a little bit further along. We read from chapter 18 and 21 and we hear of these people of Abraham and Sarah. You see, after the creation, things did not go as they should and we ate, we ate from the tree of good and evil thus trying to know the mind of God and control the direction of what should be done and decide who is good and who is evil. 
We see that God has tried so many ways to bring humanity back into the garden, this place of grace, of abundance, of life everlasting. And things have not gone as they should. The plan has changed from all humanity to maybe just one household that God will go forward with. And he tries some different ways. And you have the covenant with Noah. <coughs> and that doesn't go so well. There's a lot in that story. But God says, I'll never do this again. And so God makes a covenant to walk beside Abram and Sarai, later to be called Abraham and Sarah. God walks with them, makes a covenant with them. A covenant. A covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together towards a common goal. Towards a common goal. God switches from Noah to Abram and Sarah and makes a covenant in chapter 12 of Genesis, saying this I will bless those who bless you, those who curse you I will curse, all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. And he speaks to God and gives a covenant in two ways both that he will be the father of a great nation and have a great name. And then he will give him a blessing of all the peoples of the earth. Later, God in chapter 15 gives another covenant to Abram. As he says, Look up at the sky and count the stars if you think you can count them. God continued to say, This is how many children you will have. And we see that the covenant with Abram is for two things that his household will multiply beyond belief. Even back then, looking up at the sky, without the knowledge that we had, you could not count the stars. Now, with the depth of the universe before us, we know that it is grander than our conception. We cannot even understand it. But the second thing he said is that you will have a home in a land filled with milk a land of promise, a land of abundance. Abram and Abraham and Sarai and Sarah, these two, the covenant was given to Abraham and Sarah. But they're getting older in age. All of a sudden, they're 99 years old. They've tried a few things. They thought at one point, maybe... Maybe Hagar was in the mix. And God said, no, the child will come from you, Sarah. They're getting old in English. It says 99 years old. Older than most of the members of our church. Right? They've lived their life. They've been told these promises, these dreams. They've been told these these grand things that can happen, and they're getting old and tired. We don't like that word old. We try to use other words. Seasoned. Right? The truth is, things have not ended how they thought that it would. We see God coming again today. And just before chapter 18, the covenant is reinstituted. They come to a moment to, to make a symbolism of the covenant. And Abraham gathers all of the men of his tribe together, and they come together, and they, and they have this moment where Abraham, at 99 years old, do not let the reading fall short on you. The absurdity of this. At 99 years old, he is circumcised <coughs> under the tree of Mamre. He's in this repose, as a 99-year-old man would be after being circumcised. A repose of lying down on the ground and hopefully recovering. 
I don't know if we can say it was rest. When he feels the presence of God still with him. This tree, it says, that he's with. And we have to think about who is he with and where is he at. Mamre, the oak tree of Mamre, where Abraham has already been, where he has already placed an altar to the Lord after the covenant was renewed. The first century historian Josephus says that the terabith of Mamre is, an old, is, is as old as the world itself. Another tradition, this is the place of uh, in the spot where the altar and the temple of the Lord will eventually stand. The truth of the matter is, it's a very important place. And the encounter is between God and Yahweh. What you should think when you hear the first verse is this is a holy space. This is an important space. There's weight here. And Abraham, recovering, as he lounges under the tree, as he finds healing, finds strangers in his midst. And he greets them. Here is where the scene becomes interesting. It says that there's three strangers. There's great debate of who these strangers might be. There's a tradition that says these are God in the midst, but he's already been with God in this covenant relationship. We don't know who these strangers are. Often in the Christian church, we talk about hospitality here, and there is a notion of hospitality. Maybe it's travelers. Maybe it's sojourners. Maybe it's immigrants. They're traveling through the middle of the day, which was not an a time when you would travel. It was a time for lounging because it was a time that was hot in their travel. The rabbinic tra tradition says that Abraham is meeting with the divine but steps away to care with those people in front of him. And the Talmud says... That welcoming the stranger is greater than welcoming the divine presence itself. And Abraham sows abundant and overwhelming hospitality. He stops all that he is doing, 99 years old, just circumcised, stops all that he is doing to jump up, giddy in his spirit, and welcome people. He doesn't have too much going on. He isn't caught up in a different ideology. He jumps up. Abraham moves fast and, and quick. And he rushes to gather all the things. He doesn't have his servants gather the things. He goes and does it himself. And as you read what he brought, the finest bread, he brought the fatted calf, he brought the water and the wine, he brought the barbecue and the feast and the family gathering. He lit the fire and gathered the supplies for s'mores. <coughs> he jumped up with hospitality to see God with him, with those that are there. The Talmud says, welcoming the stranger is greater than welcoming the divine presence itself. Somehow, when we welcome a stranger, we welcome God in our midst. <coughs> These three strangers become messengers of the good news. Some of our tradition says they were angels, angelic, doing Gelion, to be a messenger of the good news. Message of hope, a message of something good. A declaration of promise. There is something here about how we greet life. Are we too busy? Are we too inward? Are we too concerned with what could be, what would be, what should be? 
to fail to take the time to greet life as if God is in every moment. God will make you laugh if you're open to it. How do we greet those around us? How do we perceive the things in our midst? And they give a message. They sit down, Abraham, as he's gathered all this feast, this great wealth of what he provides for them. They sit down with them. And somehow they know, where's your wife Sarah? Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Abraham says, come meet my wife Sarah. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that I have a wife Sarah. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Abraham is married to these three people, these travelers. But they know. And they ask, where is she? Where is she? And we hear that as they give this blessing, as they give this hope, as they give this message of the good news, these 99-year-old seasoned individuals who have waited for a promise, have waited for God to follow through with the covenant, have waited and waited and waited, and life has not shown up as it would be, as it could be, as it should be. say that your wife, this time by next year, will have a child. And it says she laughs. To herself. To herself. It says maybe in the scripture as we read it differently, in the Hebrew it says in her belly she laughs. What that means, as I said to Carmen, is it doesn't mean that she was hungry. It means that she was laughing in her very soul. Maybe a ha-ha laugh, maybe a ha-ha laugh, maybe a laugh that said this was ridiculous. Maybe a laugh that came out of turmoil. The Hebrew is placket, to take note of. It says God took note of her. This verb comes from the name of God, later it's used as the name of God, as one who remembers. He remembers, God remembers the covenant and the laugh. Now often we say, we put shame on Sarah, to say that Sarah shouldn't have laughed. How dare she laugh at God? How dare she do this? But I don't think that this scripture says that Sarah was laughing at God. I don't think it says that she was unfaithful or that there's a rebuke here, for later Abraham laughs as well. I think there's something here. She's been told that she will be the mother of a great nation. She's been told that life will bring blessing in her midst, that there'll be a land that they go into of milk and honey. She's been told and been given a covenant, and she hasn't seen it. 99 now. Scripture says that she even says, after being asked, why did you laugh? Not, why did you laugh? But, why did you laugh? Well, I wasn't laughing at you, God. It's just that I'm beyond my childbearing years. 99. Older than the oldest member in our church. God delivers this line. So important. Is anything too great for God? Is anything too great for God? We'll hear this out of the bowels, the mouth of Jesus later. Is there nothing impossible for God? So what does this passage mean for the church? For us in our lives. Are we carrying with us around things, hopes for something more that have gone unfulfilled? 
Maybe we have stopped trying because we believe it is no longer possible. Maybe we carry pain or shame because we believe we aren't good enough to get the good stuff of life. Maybe as a church, maybe as a church, we carry around those things. Or we thought God would show up. Or we thought God would amplify. Or we thought God would increase. Maybe we carry that around with us. What does this passage say to those that are 99 years old? Have gone through the turmoil and the strife and the hardships. Life just hasn't worked out as they thought it would. What could have been, what would have been, what should have been. What does it mean to stare in the void? To stare deep into inky blackness of darkness and the absence of what we wanted. And to laugh once again with God. To let go. A belly laugh deep from inside. A belly laugh. To say, is it possible, God? Is it possible <coughs> once more? I don't know. Maybe we feel like we're too tired, too old, too beyond the prime of our youthful possibilities. But God still has the ability to birth something in our midst to struggle through the labor pains of our own desires, our own doubts, our own, our own inability to see beyond the fold of what has happened in the past, to, to deliver something good and holy to us once again. I said to the kids, one of the greatest things that I've carried with me in my life, and it was instilled to me by my parents, my my dad, who was a United Methodist pastor, and also the churches that I grew up in, was this centeredness that comes with knowing that God can show up. To just look around the corner. Do we keep our eyes open? Do we wait upon? Do we welcome the strangers in our midst? And the strange circumstances <laughs> were not usual in our midst to see where God will show up. Because God can make you laugh. I want to take a moment to be in a prayer of intercession, if you would be with me, to see where God can show up in our midst. If you would be in an attitude of prayer with this prayer is a prayer of intercession, and there will be moments of pause in it. And we'll take that moment of pause to pray for the thing that is mentioned before it. Please be an attitude of prayer. Lord, this day we will hear of the, we hear of the miracles that you have in our midst. We know of the miracles of how you have inspired the people to be called your disciples. We hear of the miracle of Sarah, who in her old age conceived a son, Isaac. We hear, have heard of the many ways that the disciples gave a man, were given a mandate to heal, to raise the dead, to proclaim the kingdom of God and the good news of your redeeming love. We stand in the lifelong line, in the long line of those who are called, equipped, and sent forth. We are ready to work for you so that this broken world may find healing. Guide us along the path that leads to abundant life. We give you thanks, O oh God, for teachers, theologians, for leaders, and all those who help us grow in faith. Raise up your leaders in the church who will change and challenge and encourage us to be your people. We pray, Lord, raise up your leaders church and beyond. We give you thanks, O God, for the bounty of your great creation. Work in us and through us that we may be 
better caretakers of all that you have made, greeting every possibility with joy in our heart. Lord, we pray that you teach us what it means to have true and abundant joy. We give you thanks, O oh God, for those who carry out your promises of healing and hospitality. Teach us how to provide care and support for those struggling with physical illness, mental illness, and spiritual wilderness. Grant healing and wholeness to the lonely and anxious in our midst, for whom we pray for now. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this community of faith. Deepen our faith and use us to work your will in the world. Let us find examples of your gracious spirit in all those we meet in these halls, in this sanctuary, and beyond these doors, and present these examples of what it means to be faithful to the world around us. We ask all these things in the name of the one who created us, sustains us, and brings us freedom. Amen. We have a moment now to, to hear about Wesley Woods Camp uh, from Isabel and Eli. So I went to Wesley Woods Camp and I was in horse camp in the in post. And so one of my favorite activities was to go on the trail ride with the horses. And I just, it was like really fun to just see most of the horses' personalities and to basically bond with them. And one way I connected with God in that way was to learn about one of his creations, that being horses. Um, and one of the reasons I think you should go to Wesley Woods camp is because if you go to a horse camp, they hand out these little horse hairs for you to collect. And,
people to be away from their parents for a while or um, yeah. and to try new things. Also, um, they have a new gift shop. Also a new pool, which is pretty fun to swim in. But I got Wesley from the gift shop. We've come to a moment in our service where we're going to collect the offering, and so will the ushers please come forward.
a stranger, as a friend, as you think about what joy might mean in your midst, God will make you laugh. Go out into the world and laugh with God.